Hello, my name is Mark Kilmurray and welcome to Ensemble Conversations. This week we should have been in the middle of rehearsals for Honour, Joanna Murray Smith's wonderful play about the breakup of a marriage. Uh, instead, here we are. But we're delighted to have Kate Champion, the director of Honour, to talk to us this morning. Hello, Kate. Hello, Mark. Hello, how are you? I'm well, thanks. How's isolation treating you? Oh, you know, I ha you have your moments, but I feel fortunate <laughs> to be, you know, a roof over my head and health and I live near the ocean. I can't complain. Fantastic. That's right. And lots of walking and uh, trying to get out and uh, keep sane and all of that. <laughs> And all of that. Um, now, Honor. I, when I saw Honor um, a little while ago, I was struck by I, what I was left with was this I sort of sense of of a sort of dreamlike play. It had this uh, quality of nightmare to it of, as well, of course, but it had this dreamlike quality that stayed with me. And I think particularly it was because of the character of Honor, because the play didn't go the way I thought it was going to go with this sort of classic setup of a breakup of a marriage uh, with a younger person involved in coming along. And I was left with this sense of something quite extraordinary. Uh, how did you feel when you, when you first read the play? Uh, I don't know if I found it dreamlike, but I think I know what you mean. There's a kind of, it's an emergence from a chrysalis, like she's captive and she kind of, through this horrible situation, ends up sort of finding herself, even though you think she's losing herself through the act of her husband leaving her for a younger woman. Mm. I think I was struck by, I was concerned when I first got into, the, into reading it, how the relevance of today and everything to do with Me Too and the shift there would, would affect this play. But I, what struck me was how, you know, completely relevant it still is because it's so layered and so nuanced and, and no one, there's no black and white and everyone has faults and everyone has merit. In, in, within the situation. Everyone has pain and everyone learns something. So yeah. I love that she, you know, and the fact that the George is seduced by the young woman, it's not the other way around. And so many of those power plays. But the, the thing that struck me was how, you know, actually in some ways the, the true uh, love or infatuation is of the younger woman to the older woman. But, but she actually wants to be her, I think. Yes, absolutely. And that's the sort of, I think that's where the play went into a different place that I, I didn't expect. It takes you by surprise. And yeah. It's, uh, it's very beautifully done. It, um, yes, how has society changed since the play has been written? What does that mean with presenting honour today? Well, I think we're just so aware of... Uh, there's been so much TV and film done about the whole, since the Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement, of issues where a man in power um, has a relationship with a younger woman in particular and how those, the, the misunderstanding of what that power means and how there is no such thing as, oh, she didn't say no, it's far more complicated than that. And so that's really... Uh, it's not really what honour's about. So I think, therefore, it can speak to this, what that means today, while still um, remaining le relevant and not being one of those stories. But it, it, we are super, we have a super heightened awareness of what it means to give consent these days. Yes, yes, absolutely. And as you say, it's from those different perspectives. That's a really interesting construction. And, and your empathy is with all of the characters. There isn't really a... A buddy in this? No, I mean you do think George comes across as quite childish, like you know, and classic midlife crisis. But then he's incredibly art articulate and eloquent about, I guess, what I would call FOMO. We, we call <laughs> FOMO now, fear of missing out, which might be a different way of uh, expressing midlife crisis. And, midlife and, just, and and the 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 panic, the panic of one life and all the opportunities within that life and how when it becomes crystal clear to you that there's another chance, another way, you the willingness to kind of lose so much, um, I think he expresses really well and you do, you know, we all have a bit of that inside us, I think. Yes, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that, that's, is, that's, is this life? Is this it? Is this it? Is this it? And, yeah. yeah. And guess. what am I throwing away? And am I live walking dead or, you know, <laughs> yes. or by, by, by losing what I've had for so many years, am I jumping off a cliff and, you know, committing some kind of other suicide? 
yes I, I know what you mean and you, I had a sense the other day of oh, oh this is my life I always feel like and maybe it's because being an actor and director that I haven't quite grown up and that one day when I do grow up I'll do this as a job and then I think actually you know you're in your late 50s this is this has been your life and also yeah. the surprising idea that you have a history and that your history you look back into elements of your life and that's part of who you are this is some naivety about life will happen soon I'm just sort of doing this for now <laughs> right well, Megan. within the play, I think Claudia, who seduces George, um, sees that in honour. She she really envies the um, speak, the woman speaking to her from a life of experience and just wants that uh, to attain that level of um, composure when you know she. Anna feels very much the mature person in the play. I think. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and that's the, the the voice you follow. I think. Um, Absolutely. When you approach a play like this, from your background uh, with uh, your own company, Force Majeure, and also working with DV8 and the choreography and the physical theatre that you have created over the years um, and all that wonderful work, do you approach it from a different uh, angle? Do you sort of first look at the visual and the physical and work your way to a naturalism or it doesn't it matter particularly when it's a play that has been constructed as honor has been constructed um, pretty much naturalistically look I think I do both I, I certainly don't focus on the physical when it's a play it's very much the text yeah. but nonetheless we're not you know I that we're not just talking heads on on something we deny that our is our, our body we get so many signals from our, from everything we do, from gesture, from stance, from like so, so much. Even I would call eye contact or lack of eye contact a, 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 almost a physical decision. So what I encourage is a, an in-depth um, investigation of the text and a lot of talking around it and a lot of research. But I really like to start the day physically because I think you even read and speak differently if we all engage in a, in a physical warm-up. And, 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 and when plays have intimacy um, within them, it's kind of necessary that there's a training so that, and we're so much more aware of that these days, but I've yes. been caught up in that for decades, that you need to ha be able to know each other's um, body weight and trust each other in a way that isn't loaded with emotions that can transfer outside the mm. rehearsal room. So, I think all of that. I think I think you work very differently if a if a group of actors work physically, particularly starting the day. I think it's so easy to come in with a cup of coffee and an egg and bacon roll and sit down. <laughs> or <laughs> yes, and I, I I I'm all for that, but I I really think I think working physically brings a whole other dimension to the interpretation of text. Even if it was at a dinner table sitting down for the entire play, mm. I would encourage. Um, a, a physical training so I think I, I but I've always been fascinated in words all the work I've done with force majeure has had text in it yes, I know, half yes. Text and half the cast of text are uh, actors so it's it's I, I love being fluid within all of that and any other art form I can get my hands on yes yes and having seen force majeure you do, you have always blended those two elements which is which is terrific um, for me, because I come from a, a sort of physical background too, do, I, I, th yeah. I think that the idea of space is important on the stage. And I, I do feel that sometimes a scene's not quite working and I realise it's because they're not standing in the right place and they're not, there's something not quite right physically about the way they're, they're looking at each other. As you say, uh, eye contact can make such a huge difference. And that informs something, it informs my work, I think, and as yours, perhaps not even consciously, it's just something that's always there from that physical Absolutely. background. Absolutely. To stand next to someone, to choose to turn your slightly away, it's all loaded with its own narrative that yeah. either informs or gives some subtext to the play. Absolutely. And, and um, I, in my experience, I do notice the reluctance of actors to actually put that bacon roll down and get up and shake their hands and legs and do a bit of a warm-up because it feels like to some actors that was drama school and now we're <laughs> now we're in the real world but it really does help uh, when, when you do it and for me it depends sometimes on the play uh, but you know I'd love to do it all the time and sometimes on the actors I you quickly know when there's too much reluctance and resistance I think to those warm ups. Uh, there's no choice with me. <laughs> yeah you do it anyway just do it yeah yeah uh, and it does help. I I, I, 
maybe that's an advantage I have, even though I know you've had a very strong physical background. Part of me wants to people to just, you know, I'm directing a play, that's what I'm doing. And but sometimes it works to my advantage that I have that. Yeah. 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 And they so they go, okay, I'm working with Kate Champion. We know we're going to be doing this physical, physical work. Do you know, uh, some of the oldest actors, some of the ones you think, oh, you know, they're getting into their 80s or late 70s, they're not going to want to do it, are sometimes the, the most enthusiastic and the ones that are there earliest, and I love them for it. Yeah. And now, do you, and so I think a warm beginning of the day, and then how do you work through the day? You'll, you'll, you'll sit around and read the tech, the script, as, 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 as we tend to do for those first few days or however long it takes. It's that first getting up on the floor. Do you break that down into sections using a couple of actors at a time or do you get everybody up on the floor at the same time? How does that uh, work, depending on the play, I suppose? Yeah, it completely depends on the play. I directed uh, A View from the Bridge in Adelaide and we actually mm. worked a lot on viewpoints and certain compositional uh, exercises. And at one stage, and we talked, we spent all afternoon, all for a week, 10 days, talking through the script and what I want to know is when I'm talking to the actors about the script is their personal connection like what resonates and you start to get to know things about where it resonates with their own lives and there's just so much of that conversation that the, you, you can then we can all carry on to the floor that I think is important yeah um, but with a view from the bridge I ended up doing uh, putting on about 45 minutes of music and we did the whole play without any words just acting out the scenes, not, not miming them, not dancing them, but just being, as you say, at a certain distance or a certain composition. And it was just incredible. So that was that play. But um, mm. yeah, yeah, I think I work differently. I like to be uh, alive to the unique quality of each play and what it might mean, rather than coming in with a formula. Yes, absolutely. And I think it took me a long time to realise that I don't need to have a formula. I just need to go with the flow and with what, what, it, what the words are saying and how the play dictates, it dictates the rehearsal room. I'm always surprised when I hear directors have a certain way of doing everything <laughs> because yeah. I think, we're, but it changes with the piece. Uh, absolutely. I mean, with Fully Committed, we realised, you know, Contessa, it's a very hard thing to learn dozens and dozens of characters on your own. So we spent a lot of time being the other characters for her in order to, before we could even really get on the floor. And I've never done that, but it was, it was what the play was telling us we needed to do. Yes, yes, and that was uh, that was the, the solo uh, show from last year that uh, Contessa Tifoni did, and it was absolutely wonderful. And she, um, but I remember those, uh, those first few technical into dress rehearsal moments of, what am I saying? <laughs> Who am I talking to? It's, uh, it was a huge, huge part. Incredible, yeah. yeah. And uh, we also have um, our writer on the line too, Joanna Murray-Smith. Hello, Joanna. I've got no sound. I can hear you. We can hear you. Can you hear we me? We can hear no. you. <laughs> no sound. Oh. And she'll be back. Um, just in terms of breaking that up, uh, um, Kate, of the idea of... Um, someone playing multiple roles. How many roles did she play in the end? Oh, I was thinking of that. Yes. Was it 37 or Something more? Something ridiculous. I know, I know it was dozens. We, that's what we went with, yeah. And some would have come easily, perhaps, than others. And then it's creating that voice, which then perhaps creates the character on the telephone or, or wherever she wanted to place it. I guess that was the trick for you directing, to guide her into that direction. Yeah, well, I think I think that play's normally done sitting down with lots of different voices, and we chose to make it more physical so mm -hmm. that she went to a different phone. So we needed, as much as she needed to find the voice, she needed to find the stance or the the physicality of that character, and it actually helped her remember it, be, to be able to know it was always, that character was always on that phone, and she always took on that particular physicality. Yes. But, um, oh, my goodness. It, that is like a that is a, an Olympic <laughs> effort. She needed a medal for, for it. Yeah, yeah, it I think so. Yeah. And just knowing it, knowing it, and learning it was such a huge effort too. But you know, I think I think when she got on, when she when she had it under her control, I could also see the the joy and the real muscle yeah, that she yeah. was using to accomplish it was fantastic to see and brilliant. Yes, that's right. And she guided herself into those areas that you could see she knew she was on top of it. It's a bit like jazz then. She was sort of uh, improvising on top of what, what she'd already created. And a, an incredible relationship with the stage manager because the cueing was, you know, so it was almost like a duet they were yes. doing. 
Yeah, that's right. A backstage and stage manager is very, very important, always, but particularly so in that play with uh, all those those ringing phones, telephones, and <laughs> everything else that was going on. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, do you enjoy working solo as well with solo actors and performers? You know, I do. I actually do. And I'm doing another monologue later on this year. Yep. I, I, I guess I don't want to have a reputation for, to, you know, uh, although maybe in these times that might, might not be such a bad thing. Mm. There's something about um, the intensity of the collaboration and it's, it's, a, it's an incredible trust and re uh, relationship you develop, which you develop with any actor in a play, but it's dispersed when there's more because they can have relationships with each other and just the care and the trust and the investigation that yes. it seemed more intense and somehow not more satisfying, but definitely deeply satisfying. And and I've done two solo shows myself, so I know the vulnerability of being out there on your own. And yeah. um, I, I guess I just, I love the bravery of it. And I, I actually, as a writer, uh, thinking of the writing of a one, per, one person show, I admire when you can hold our attention for that long. That's why I love stand up <laughs> comic. Yes, just, too, absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah. a mic and a person and you're in front of me and I am um, haven't Absolutely. even noticed the time's gone by. I, I, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's something about the essential storytelling nature of it that yeah. is boiled down that I love about it. I agree. Also, um, oh, hello, Joanna, you're back. Can you hear us? Yes. yes hello. Back. How are you? Hello. Good. I'm so sorry. No, sorry. You're probably busy writing, I think. Oh. <laughs> the time went by. <laughs> um Joanna, we're just talking about the character, just to go back to Honor, that the idea for me that I was left with her, her voice and how she dealt with a terrible situation. I'm just wondering where that came from, from for you, of creating a character that went, was in a play that was a, a situation that we've heard of and, and we know of, but the fact that it went into a different place for me when I saw it uh, a few years ago, that was quite um, surprising. And I was left with the idea of this, this way of controlling your life. Where did, where, did that, where did that come from for you? Was that part of the research or part of the spark of the play? Oh, there was no research at all. I mean, it was really about the kinds of people that I grew up amongst, uh, that the husbands were all sort of public figures and the women seemed to be equally intelligent, if not more intelligent than the husbands. But they very rarely had public uh, lives. And, you know, my parents were left intellectuals. They were surrounded by publishers and writers and journalists and artists. And um, I always felt that there was a kind of injustice that these women supported the men so well for so long and very willingly, um, only to be left um, at the point in their life where they should be reaping the rewards. So it was sort of autobiographical in that sense, but um, I should say that my parents didn't split up. My father did not leave my mother. Oh, right. But, um, but it was very common. Yes, <laughs> yes, of course. And, and we were just talking about the idea that it's written th these points of view from each character and that there isn't... You, you sort of... You can understand all their points of view very clearly, and that isn't always the case with material such as this. No, I mean, I thought very strongly that in order for the play to work, you had to really feel sympathy for all the positions. And so I tried very hard to, as writers always, to, to inhabit every character with, um, you know, a very kind of strong sense of empathy. Even mm -hmm. the, the so-called imbo of Claudia, who's so easy to judge and so easy to damn, um, I wanted also to sort of bring out in her a sense of the power that everybody feels when they're young, that, that excitement of discovering your own sexual power, um, the willingness to uh, learn lessons um, and to grow morally and uh, in your understanding of the world um, relationships. So mm. I didn't want her to be sort of, I, I understood the audience would judge her, but I wanted the audience to also they were being honest with themselves, recognise themselves in her, particularly women. 
And with the, with the husband, I think that no one doesn't really empathise with the idea of facing your own mortality and that desire to have more than one life, mm. you know, that you feel that you are contemplating, the older you get, you're contemplating the lives that you didn't take up when you were younger. Yes. And that longing that you feel to be with someone who doesn't see you with clear eyes, who sees you with um, idealistic um, eyes. Yes. You know, and in a way, I think the marriages that last are the ones which allow little glimmers of that youthful admiration to peek through the grim reality of who we really are. Mm. Yes, <laughs> that's very, very well put. Yes, of course. Mm. Now, interesting. It also has that universal theme, um, and I know it's been uh, produced all over the world. And you, I wonder how that changes from country to country. I, I guess, I mean, it's the same play, but the responses to that must, must differ greatly, I would say. Uh, well, I've always been astonished at how little they change. Um, mm. The play has been done across so many different cultures, uh, not just, you know, in the English-speaking world, but it's been done in Israel and Malaysia and... Um, uh, other parts of uh, Asia, it's been done in Japan a few times. Um, and I've seen a number of productions in different countries, and I'm always astonished at the fact that people laugh in exactly the same places, mm -hmm. they cry in the same places, uh, and if, if I don't speak the language, I can more or less follow every line through yeah. the intonation of the performances. Yeah. So it says something about, I don't know, maybe very sad about the universality <laughs> yes. of the story but um but even i think um people respond across cultures to the fact that nothing is simple you know mm. that we have these situations in which the morality seems to be black and white but actually all of us whatever way we enter the play whether uh we're of the younger male or female uh we understand that to be human is to be complex, and yeah. um, that even when we behave badly, sometimes we behave badly for very understandable reasons. Yes, right, yes indeed, absolutely. We were just talking, Kate and I were just talking earlier about how society has changed since you wrote the play and what that means. What, how do you feel that impacts on a today as opposed to, say, when it was first written? Well, it's interesting. I mean, it, it impacts on me personally because I used to identify with Claudia and now I identify with Anna. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. But, um, yes. Sadly. Yes, right. Uh, but um, I think in terms of the world, well, this is not a story which is dated, really. I mean, mm. in leaving their wives, younger women, uh, more than more than women leave their husbands to younger men. Um but I do think that women are probably more empowered, to use a cliched word, um, to f find recognition in society and a certain degree of kind of comfort. That I think there are, um, there is an awareness of the feminist angle of this story, which allows women to identify and find comfort with other women more easily than they probably did when my, you know, when I was growing up. Mm, yes, of course. Do you now, just in terms of rehearsal room, which we haven't got to, but hopefully we will get to at some point. Um, Kate uh, and Joanna, how do you work that out between you? As it, Joanna, do you go into rehearsals, and Kate, do you like the writer in the rehearsal? How 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 does that work? <laughs> Well, we never got the chance. No, yet. no. But the, the plan is definitely to have Joanna in the room. I, I, there can be no g more wonderful thing to have than to have the source of the material. Yes. And I know actors love it. And just the questions and that, I mean, I, I, if I have a chance, always, always, I, you know, would like I, to have the writer. I think it, at the beginning, but then so I also think there's a point where yeah. it's good that they can go away and then <laughs> come back. I don't think they need to stay. Yeah. I um, feel that it's absolutely vital for the writer to be in the room for the first week 
of a new play, um, I feel with honour that it's um, had so many productions now and I've done so much rewriting and reworking and tweaking and editing that um, Kate is uh, so accomplished that she doesn't need me there at all. But given that I live an hour away and I frequently live, you know, 30 hours away from a production, it seems like a nice um, opportunity to be there. And, I, of course, I always love seeing new versions. I love seeing new casts um, and all those interactions with the other creative personnel, Kate and the actors uh, and the designers, always um, is incredibly nurturing to a playwright. I mean, you spend so much time on your own. uh, To have that opportunity to actually uh, experience um, uh, the particular particular idiosyncrasies of each production what certain actors bring that other actors never have Mm -hmm. and it's it's amazing how every production that is the case i mean Mm -hmm. in every production the actors bring something that is utterly specific with them and that that of course is the magic and the mystery of um live performance yes of course and it's quite thrilling that sense of seeing that multiple times to, to to always feel there's something different for you to to watch that's right. And, I mean, even if you see many uh, performances of the same production, it's different from show to show. Uh, it can be different from the matinee to the evening performance. So you never feel as if you really mm. can fix your play uh, to the earth. You know, the pl- a play is a, a constantly living, constantly transforming, constantly ephemeral um, piece of art. And uh, as a writer, your feelings are as amorphous as the um, as the uh, live performance experience. Sometimes you love what you've done. Sometimes you're very critical of it, um, mm. and that that can change from moment to moment. Of course, yes. Well, look, I hope at some point we can get you both into a rehearsal room very soon. Um, Thank you so much for talking to us today. Uh, It's been a pleasure talking to both of you. Uh, Thank you, Kate Champion, and thank you, Joanna Murray-Smith. I've never interviewed a famous writer in their car before, so this is is a first. Um, I hope to do that. That's probably a whole new new series. And also also one who is an absolute technology Luddite. You know, so this is like... You, you cannot believe what this is. This is like my whole personality is going to transform from oh, this completely. point on. Um, <laughs> just, yes, indeed. But just before you go, we just have one question from, from somebody who's watching now. Just We've only got time for one, unfortunately. Yeah, so Rachel asks, do you think the current COVID situation will inspire future plays? I'm sure lockdown has put a strain on a few relationships. Did you hear that? Would yeah. the Would, yes, COVID inspire new plays? What do you think? Well, definitely. Um, I've already just written um, a five to seven minute monologue for a theatre company in America, Milwaukee Repertory. Anybody can look up their website. They commissioned 10 writers from around America and me, because I I guess I have a a history with the company, Mm. uh, to do a monologue for a different actor um, on the theme of hope and resilience coming out of the uh, pandemic. And it was very fun to do and, you know, everybody's approached it totally differently and each actor has filmed it in their own apartment um, and they're now streaming. Fantastic. That sounds great. Um, Kate, do you think that's going to, we're going to see more of that? Uh, Yes, but I also, yeah, I think we will, but I hope we don't. um, See too much. (laughs) (laughs) I think it will. Things will grow from it and be influenced, yeah. but it won't be the only thing. But yeah, we we will. You take everything. You have to respond to to the truth and the reality around you. I think it's yes, um, the source of creativity. And I, you hope that it will be a footnote in a few years rather than a big talking theme. You know, you hope that this is a period of time that we won't be going through again very very soon. Although we are all seeing so much writing that occurred during the plague that I was unaware of. So yes, I, that's true. Yes, sonnets and, came out also, of the plague. And also I think that, um, you know, for us who've been in a kind of relatively lucky bubble in Australia, um, there have been silver linings. I mean, yes. in terms of receiving 
uh, other people's creativity, you know, reading, listening to music, yeah. watching a lot. Absolutely. I mean, I feel, I feel like people have had an opportunity to reflect, to slow down, to absorb. And I think that all of those things are going to um, find great kind of flourishing in the yeah. work that comes after this. Whether it's on the theme of the pandemic, I don't know, but I think it will definitely be influenced by it. Yes, absolutely. Yes, we might see that Romeo and Juliet with face masks even yet. That would be, that'd be quite interesting. Um, yes, I've taken up the ukulele. So, you know, there's things that you've always wanted to do and now you can sort, you sort of got a bit more time to do it, which is fantastic. Uh, again, thank you both for talking to us today. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Joanna. It's been a pleasure thank talking you. to you. We could have talked all morning, but we'll let you go and continue driving thank and continue you. doing whatever you're doing, Kate. And we'll speak to you very soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Hi. Thank you. That was Kate Champion and Joanna Murray Smith and talking about honour. Uh, next week we'll be talking to Wesley Enoch, director, artistic director of the Sydney Festival, which I'm very much looking forward to. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for your donations and thank you for keeping us here and thank you for being part of this. Bye. <laughs>